Welcome to a Fragmentarium video conference. I am William Duba, Project Manager of Fragmentarium and your host and moderator. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Ivana Dolceva. Ms. Dolceva has been working for years with Fragments and has anchored several Fragmentarium projects to publish and to describe Fragments. As a matter of fact, she currently holds a record of well over 600 descriptions published on Fragmentarium. Today, she will be speaking on From Trash to Treasure, working with Fragments from the University Library in Leipzig and the Austrian National Library in Vienna. After her presentation, we will have some time for questions. Since there are quite a few of us here, I will ask that you write your questions in the chat and I will read them aloud. Now, without further ado, I hand the floor over to Ms. Dobcheva. Thank you, Bill. So I will now try to share my screen with you. Uh, hopefully it works and you all see it. Great. So thank you for having me. And uh, now I'll be uh, quickly giving you um, uh, so, so a short plan of my uh, talk today. So first I'll give you a short overview of the project, uh, the project I worked on. And in order not to make this, to make this less boring, uh, there will be example to, from fragments to illustrate uh, both the importance of the project and the fragments. Uh, and the second point, there will be a history of fragmentology. Uh, so meanings mm, look at uh, when librarians started getting interested in writing ways uh, in both collections and uh, to what, or um, more properly said, which pieces of fragments uh, drew their attention, and uh, respectively, how did they study, publish, and arrange them in their collections. And again, not to bore you, this will be presented with evidence taken from fragments. And uh, then as a third point, there will be a jump to uh, our modern approaches to fragmentology. Uh, meaning what we nowadays, uh, how we nowadays study, publish, and uh, document fragments. Uh, so to start with the first project where I did, uh, where I started uh, working on fragments, this was in Leipzig uh, back at uh, 2016 and 17. And the, the goal of the project was actually to make uh, kind of like uh, to establish a time management scheme through the scientific, but also succinct description of fragments meaning uh, how long would it take to describe uh, fragments. So on an average, we took around four hours, uh, which uh, let us actually this let, let us act, uh, to examine and to describe uh, 260 fragments, which are now published in Fragmentarium. And of course, there are uh, the exceptions where uh, well, one is interested more in a fragment and spend definitely more than four hours. Then takes also William Duba to help around with uh, the notation. And uh, here is uh, what you see is a mortuary roll, so called, although it's, it wasn't a roll, it was a sheet of paper, it's a, a sheet of parchment as we established. And it uh, is actually called Titulus. And it describes uh, a travel made uh, in the time of Lent uh, from mines up the Rhine to Maastricht and Gladbach. And there's no dating on the date on the fragment itself, but it was possible uh, looking at the Eastern dates, which were mentioned, and uh, the possibilities when these, uh, so for example, Dominica de Ministra, when it falls on which date, to say that it was uh, written and it traveled either at uh, uh, 1257 or 1268. So it's a piece that is actually quite Im important for paleography because it gives you like a non-normalized uh, hand and it's nice for future comparison. Uh, the second project again in Leipzig, which uh, was uh, which ran for three months so last year. Mm, the main uh, point was uh, to describe uh, 50 and actually 70 fragments. So for 20 of them, there were already descriptions made. Uh, so it, uh, anyway, there are seven fragments which are kept in around uh, seven fragment volumes. And the specific goal of the project was uh, to look at and study the beginning of the fragment collection, meaning, as I said, like how exactly librarians back in the 19th century um, studied and collected fragments. 
and it uh, it was actually planned from the beginning on to be kind of like describing fragments based on digitization with assistant in the Leipzig uh, Bibliothek uh, who um, was uh, doing the ecological measurements and me sitting in Vienna and doing the descriptions and putting them on fragmentarium. Well, initially I did plan actually to go and visit Leipzig and look at the fragments myself, but uh, well, it turns out otherwise, but it's also possible to travel last year. So it was really a totally in absentia uh, description. Uh, and to give you an idea of how, what exactly this fragment volume looks like, well, it's not a unique case. We have already seen this in the BNF in the previous uh, fragmentarium video conference. There are also such in St. Gallen, as I know, to give you just two examples. So we have uh, marmor um, bound volumes. And instead of sheet of paper or parchment, we have uh, these kind of like guards on which the fragments are attached, usually glued. And the third project uh, where examples will be taken on are ran in the Austrian National Library for a little over two years. And this time it was uh, a project which was centered on a specific monastic and binding center. So the monastery of Monze, which is located in Upper Austria, it was uh, survived from the 8th century till the uh, mid or late 18th century. Uh, and it was uh, also a very nice uh, case to study because it had also a binding workshop within the monastery. So we know that they could use their own binding waste to bind their volumes, which uh, happened in the 15th century. So the result uh, in Fragmentarium, there are now around uh, 560 published fragments. Uh, to give you, however, a more detailed uh, evaluation, since uh, also the nice thing about Monza is that all the manuscripts are now at the Austrian National Library with very few uh, being uh, elsewhere. It was possible to study a whole corpus of manuscript and then to establish in how many of the uh, manuscript there are fragments, in how many there aren't, in how many of the paper manuscript there are so-called sewing guards. So it was a really nice case study also about binding practices. And although I'm not a binding historian, I think we could also deliver some data to be used for future perhaps studies. And altogether, there are around more than 1,000 fragments that we were able to find. However, we couldn't not uh, describe all of them. Some were you know, unreadable or were, uh, contained no text or not, not enough. And here in brackets, you see the number of fragments which we actually could describe. Uh, the ones that in the, the Austrian National Library, the ones that are in the state uh, library. These are in situ fragments in incunables. And then in the state archive in Upper Austria are again used as binding waste for archival materials. And 21 fragments are found in other collections in Austria or Europe and well, actually the USA also. So this first. Uh, anyway, all three projects had uh, one main goal, which was common to all of them, um, mainly to make the material not only known to scholars for future and in-depth studies, uh, but also to make it available and searchable online. And in this case, Fragmentarium was the obvious partner and database to choose for. And uh, I suppose uh, it is uh, audience is not uh, needed, does not need any descent of fragmentology and why it is important to study fragments. So I'll only brush upon the multiple fields of related studies uh, where fragments can be used to support arguments and offer fresh material. Uh, so of course, it's, uh, it's only fair to start with liturgy, meaning seeing that uh, the majority of fragments that we have are liturgical ones. And uh, studying liturgical fragments can give, uh, of course, um, very much in, uh, information about musical notation, about uh, a lot of saints, uh, about rites and local liturgical uses, which are documents on the fragments. Uh, of course, uh, not only in Germany, it's important because of the Reformation where whole manuscripts were outdated and then disappeared, but also in other centers, uh, for example, in Monze, in 15th century came the Melk reform, 
and then all over, so all uh, older liturgical manuscripts were outdated, useless, and then uh, either destroyed or, in our case, used for recycling material. And in this particular case that we have from Leipzig, it's, uh, it's a liturgical um, fragment, a nocturnale, which also gives us a clue how long actually a fragment uh, was used. Because we take, um, based on the paleographical analysis that it was written around the third, uh, 13th or beginning of the 13th century, uh, then we have someone who actually uh, wrote again the text, probably because it was faded away or it was not legible anymore on several occasions, meaning that still in the 15th century, someone used the fragment and so uh, uh, thought it uh, seemed um, meaningful to uh, rewrite the text. So for Monze, again, it was the benefit of having a large group of fragments from one uh, collection from one monastery. And so we were able to reconstruct uh, a lot more than just uh, two bifolium as in the previous example. Um, in this case, uh, which you can also find in Fragmentarium, we managed to make a virtual reconstruction of a graduale. And based on the liturgical um, material that is uh, present on the surviving uh, leaves, which should be around uh, two thirds of the original manuscript, so quite a lot. And it was not only possible to put all this uh, material, which is important, I guess, for liturgist, for it contains the liturgy of the Hirsa monastic reform, but it was also possible to establish the previous choir structure of the manuscript. And as you can see here on the uh, left, one could very nice uh, made in fragmentarium kind of a content structure and put uh, in such empty canvases for the missing folios. So illustrating what the original choir structure would have been. Um, another case where fragments can all be perhaps as important as manuscript is the so-called Jubiläumus uh, Gemeinschaft. So a rather rare case in fragments where we have a new text found, so the one ending and the other one beginning. So on the left, uh, you see probably a not so surprising uh, two texts from um, um, Prudentius, the Psychomachia and Contra Simoha. However, on the right, you see um, perhaps not so straightforward uh, tradition of having Psychologus Theobaldi together with Prudentius Titulo Historiarum. Mm, and again, of course, another good example for books which get very um, quickly, I guess, uh, worn down and probably end up by the bookbinder are school books. Again, it's uh, perhaps another idea that they not only get worn down, but get uh, um, so out of the mode, so to say, when a new one comes. Come. So, uh, from Monte, we have uh, Sewing Guard, where it doesn't provide quite a lot of text, but it was still impossible to identify the text as uh, Rudium Doctrina. And, uh, well, I'm not specialist in the text, I haven't, I must admit, checked the manuscript tradition to say, oh, is it important or not to have uh, this uh, fragment? But still, uh, exactly as every manuscript is unique and important, so is actually the fragment because it gives us an idea how the teachers or the monks used the book and how they annotated it. Uh, here an example where one can see a marginal annotation of Calliope and above it, well, I don't, I don't see it quite well in the digitalization, but uh, in situ one could uh, definitely read Musa. And then you have an example from Leipzig. We have a, lee, a double leaf from Donatus Ars Minor. Well, again, not an uh, uncommon uh, book, you would say. Uh, but it is an important uh, uh, evidence to see how exactly the books, uh, books look like, how were they, how many choirs they had, uh, what kind of a script, and how they were written. And in this case, we have actually the beginning of the um, work together with the end with already the dotio uh, 
declination. So we could say that this was uh, actually quite a pocket, perhaps a booklet, uh, which uh, in one uh, quaternia there was all the all work of Donatus. Mm. In the course, uh, when one look at fragments, uh, perhaps the first thing that one uh, would say that, oh, at least when I was talking about, the, oh, I'm working on fragments from Leipzig, I was like, oh, there was a Parsifal fragment. I was like, yes, there was, but yeah, I'm doing not so uh, famous ones. Mm, uh, and still, even if it's not Parsifal or it's kind of not a Nibelungen um, lead, uh, it is uh, still important, especially I think about uh, commentaries, like in this example of Remigio's commentum in Martianum Capella. Or often commentaries, uh, medieval commentaries, are, don't have such a stable text. And hence, every manuscript and every fragment which represents a unique manuscript counts in this for establishing manuscript tradition and uh, the use of the text. And kind of the same is uh, also valid for medical text, for which there are also quite a lot. Uh, here are two examples, the one from Vienna and another one from Leipzig. And uh, I think it's also especially true, the importance of fragments when it uh, comes to collection of excerpts, like in this uh, in the example of Leipzig, one could clearly see that it's a kind of compilation of different uh, works, different standard works which were not uh, documented as uh, work on its own. Mm. And again, important, of course, a fragment for the paleography. And uh, in this case, it's a charter or a copy of chartillery from Naumburg, written in about the 13th uh, century, third quarter, one would say. And since one knows uh, it is written there, it's kind of like a nice example for uh, the future comparison. Uh, it's also uh, interesting for the monastic and local history. And we already have actually Alexander Sempna from Leipzig, who uh, is going to publish an article of exactly this uh, piece in the Archiv uh, für Diplomatic, um, uh, I heard. So, uh, and while the Leipzig piece is taken, there are quite a lot of Monze, if anyone is interested. So uh, in this example, we have uh, actually a convolute of uh, fragments, manuscript fragments, and uh, also correspondence, letters, as you can see, rotor, uh, which are all came up from one binding. So they were used, dashed one over the other. And although some of these fragments are not, uh, so to say, fragments proper, since some are whole letters or lists, uh, list of lectures that you can see one of them. And so these are kind of like ephemera documents, which, well, unless uh, they were not landed in the binding ways, they would probably not have reached us. So it's kind of important also to document them. And even if their place is not straightforward in fragmentarium, still it would be nice to have them in a catalog in the library. And a favorite example of mine, uh, documenting also the another aspect, meaning the aesthetical preferences of a binder or a book owner. So in this example, you see kind of like a strange uh, uh, leaf. And the strange becomes that actually the binder or uh, exactly the owner uh, wasn't or took effort to rearrange and stitch up the original leaf, which would have looked like something like this. So. He took an effort uh, to put the nice miniature and the initial and to position them so that and they would be uh, on the front board while the in original form they would have land up on the backboard. Then he cut the turn zone from the back and stitch them also here and here. And there are also read like other examples, but from Leipzig and Monze, I would say that that's the most remarkable one. Uh, so, again, uh, moving to another aspect of fragmentology and what uh, fragments can tell us, uh, well, it's about the history of, uh, of fragmentology or exactly how did uh, uh, previous librarians looked at fragments and how they studied them. 
Um, so it's usually not documented how exactly this happened. So the case of uh, the UBA, um, UBL is a special and rare case. Since we have kind of like encapsulated the interest of the librarian in this uh, seven fragmentary volumes that we uh, looked upon in, uh, during our last project. So the beginning actually of uh, the beginning was uh, the first librarian who took interest in fragments or documented interest was Herman Leiser. So he was a librarian in the first uh, half of the 19th century and he was um, took special interest in the manuscript collection. There is the so-called Leiser Zettel, which uh, would have been kind of like the first catalog of all UBL manuscript from the, and it was uh, made around the 1830s. It's kind of like the catalog that uh, uh, was used kind of uh, for, as an inventory to guide other scholars, among them also Karl Sudhoff, the German historian of medicine. So it, one would look at particular manuscript and would not have to go through the whole collection. And Leiser did more than just the inventory. So he studied, wrote, and published on a number of manuscripts and fragments. And uh, in one of his publications, he says, while inspecting some manuscripts and early prints in the university library in Leipzig, I discovered four parchment leaves glued on the inner board of 15th or early 16th century print with a low text. These leaves include fragments from an old Dutch didactic song, which is the Roman de la Rose in the Dutch collection. And this is a like selected uh, uh, bibliography of his, which dealt with fragments and which also illustrate actually his interest for one can see that apart from the necrologue of the monastery of Alzele, he was interested in either vernacular or in sermons or in uh, well, German uh, again vernacular fragments. Uh, and since I was doing the project, it was only fair to look at his unpublished works hoping that I would find something there, meaning mentioning that he looked at some particular fragments or some unpublished uh, descriptions thereof. Or, and at first I was kind of disappointed because, uh, as I said, he was interested in sermons, in um, folk lit, uh, series, sorry, and German vernacular fragments. But on a close look, actually, one can see which manuscript he studied more profoundly. So we know from his uh, early catalog that he made that he probably went through all the manuscript. So, but some of them he looked in more detail, as it's clear from his uh, Nachlass. And this is an example, one example, so the manuscript 214, where he uh, transcribed some of the leaves. He also detached the front page down. And this we know from his uh, note, which where one uh, can recognize his hand. It comes up in more than one fragments and one than one document. And uh, well, it's a kind of like a classical text, one would say. So it's uh, kind of important and it's also an early one. And probably that's why it drew his interest. The other page down, it was, uh, which we see here, was detached only in 1892, 91. Um, probably because it was a later 15th century, it was a charter or a copy, even a copy of a charter, so not the, probably didn't fit his interest. Another example is from the manuscript uh, 127. Again, we have uh, his hand writing on the already detached fragment that it comes from this manuscript. However, on the manuscript itself, the other face down on the back remained in situ. And I must confess that I found it yesterday and still cannot identify the text. I think it should be a commentary of probably a classical text or, yeah, but I'm still about to identify it. Any help is, of course, welcomed. Uh, moving to another example, uh, we have actually uh, again a detached leaf on the left and the one that stayed still in situ or and probably again one can only speculate 
with one attracted his interest because it's a uh, Carolingian, while the other it's already textualis, so it's a bit later on, although both of them are liturgical fragments. Uh, that being said, however, there are also the exceptions. So again, from his uh, unpublished work, we know that he studied in detail manuscript 946. Uh, uh, but a nice Carolingian fragment, a Bible fragment, uh, remained in situ. Again, it's, since there are no diaries back from that time, we cannot say what exactly happened. He didn't have time, he didn't have the resources, or at the time he wasn't uh, yet interested in fragments and didn't want to detach them, but uh, yeah. Uh, so after the early death of uh, Lyser, it was up to Ernst Gotthelt Gerstorf, uh, the librarian who was also librarian at, during Lyser's time, uh, to continue um, his work. And uh, it is actually Gerstorf, uh, probably upon his orders, that um, these uh, seven fragment volumes were uh, made. There were three later one, which is, uh, you can see, the one with uh, these three were bound a bit later on. Uh, and we are not sure how exactly or who ordered the material, if it was Gerstorf who decided that uh, they should be um, thematically ordered or uh, periodically ordered. We know from the back of the volumes, which have uh, these labels, that the, the first one is with Actores Veteris, meaning a collection of predominantly classical text, while the other ones has labels which uh, den denote the uh, probable date of origin of them. Uh, and that being said, it's not clear if uh, the fragments were already stapled in this kind of like collection or if it was Gerstoff who ordered them in this way. And again, we know that there are fragments which Lyser himself detached, as uh, we again have his uh, hand uh, writing the provenance. So the one is from the mortuary roll that I already mentioned, and which did not make it in these fragmentary volumes, perhaps not representative enough, not nice enough. Uh, while another one, here an example, uh, just to compare the hands, the commentary of Statius um, made it in the fragmentary volumes, probably because it's a classical text and established with tradition. And moving uh, southeast uh, to Vienna, um, just to say that, uh, well, it's uh, a common thing that uh, librarians started having interest in the 19th century in fragments. In the Austrian National Library, one finds fragments in more or less three places. Uh, so of course, there are the ones which are in situ. There are the ones which are detached and kind of like the fragment volume in Leipzig are the nice one, the one with illumination, the nice one, the one with classical authors or vernacular. Uh, although one would say the difference is with the Codices Series no on Codices, they preserve one fragment. So they're not collections of different uh, of fragments from different texts, but one text. And uh, also there is uh, the collection of fragments per se, with over 1,700 shelf marks. And also a difference to Leipzig is that there are quite a lot in this collection of detached sewing guards. So I'm not sure what happened in Leipzig with the sewing guards, but uh, I've seen relatively little in the fragment collection. Mm. So yeah, and here you can see also the, again, the interest that the librarians had, had uh, because detaching sewing guards is not a practice since perhaps early 20th century, although there are some cases a bit later on, but uh, nowadays we don't do that. Uh, back yeah. then, however, uh, people were interested again, as you can, as you see, it's either Carolingian, early Carolingian manuscript, uh, or it's a uh, um, fragment with illuminations and like 12th century, 13th century. It's a kind of the thing that attracted their attention. It's relatively rare that we have these 13th century detached sewing guards 
in this case, probably a dumatus, uh, judging by the whole series of pronomena here. Uh, and perhaps a master example of detaching in the Austrian National Library is the uh, Codex Series Nova 2065, which are Pistole Pauli. And this uh, started surely at the 19th century and it's still going on since we still find fragments from the fragment collection, which had to be uh, added to this uh, now already a virtual reconstruction. And there are 211 items, which can be now uh, made so reconstructed to 92 former leaves. And as you can see, there are all kinds of like fragments. It comes also from Monze. And apparently in they you were quite uh, you know, diligent in using every piece of parchment that they could, either for paste downs, for sewing guards, for spine linings, more or less everything you see there. And as I said, so this uh, collection is still growing. Since uh, only this summer, I uh, was able to find or find again, <laughs> as it uh, seems, another piece of it. So as you see, there's uh, the librarian from the 19th century who already identified the piece as uh, coming from the Bible, but it was not uh, connected to this uh, conglomerate of uh, Monse. So now we have to rearrange it. It's still remarkable that they managed to do uh, the text identification without full text uh, screens and so, because that's how I did it. So it's uh, kind of the work in progress. Uh, with another Bible fragment, like again from Monze, and it was dispersed in several fragment shelf marks. Uh, and piecing up together the pieces uh, was, yes, it was hard, but uh, still I had uh, my full text uh, search databases and it was surely significantly easier as in the 19th century. Uh, and again, from this uh, uh, Bible survived quite, again, a lot of leaves. Uh, they are already in fragmentarium and uh, yeah, important for the documentation was also to put as a metadata, this virtual reconstruction from which many fragmentary uh, shelf marks come from. Uh, so again, uh, however, in some cases, uh, it's uh, the same peculiarities as in Leipzig. One find uh, in uh, one detached uh, fragment, in this case, in the series Nova 222. And one, mm, because of the mm, mm, shelf mark left from the host volume, we know that it was detached from this uh, codex. However, when one look at the codex itself, on the other page down, there's a fragment from the very same original manuscript, which remained in situ. Again, one would definitely need a bit more of documentation. How come one got detached and the other one remained in situ? Was it a work by the restoration necessary? And then they detached it and left it in the fragmentary uh, collection? Or was it interest? perhaps in some initial that was present here and not here, not here. Again, one can only speculate with how nowadays documentation is done is a, kind of like one of my favorite example, kind of museum perhaps. Uh, and uh, well, it's not very practical for working with the fragments if one wants to see the backside of them, uh, but uh, it definitely shows uh, exactly where they were in the host volumes uh, and what role they had together with our binding material, which one was seen uh, partly on the photo. And uh, it's, um, now moving uh, further to the um, nowadays, how we would like to do it, the, 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 the special digital representation. This is not meant to be like kind of a critique because Cantos uh, Planos, which you see here on the screen, it's a database for uh, music, so for liturgical song. They uh, occasionally put uh, photos or fragments, uh, but their main focus is actually on the liturgy. However, the photos that we have 
uh, look like this one. So for someone who is actually working with the fragments and want to know more about their function, uh, about where exactly in the host volume they are, and well, it gives a little information. And that's why in Fragmentarium, which is a database specific for fragments and for all their aspects, we decided to put uh, as much uh, image material as possible. So in this case, a uh, photo of the whole uh, backboard uh, together with another image of uh, actually the strip that is coming around the first uh, wire of the text, which is again part of this fragment. Uh, together with uh, images of the binding itself. Uh, well, apart from that, there's of course the content uh, description and a very ecological and paleographical description that might uh, help further studies on the fragment. Uh, the self is uh, uh, same is also true for detached fragments. For there's also the critic that digital facsimile, they represent only, well, they are a nice facsimile, but they're not the real object. And in this case, one should uh, strive to um, show and il illuminate as much as of the materiality of the object as possible. And in this case, not only to focus on the fragment as uh, a leaf from the original manuscript and show only the one leaf uh, according to the text structure, but also show the whole fragment is uh, binding material for the binding historian who can tell a lot more than it is only a turning cover as I would only be able to say. Uh, also another thing about uh, describing fragments that uh, came up uh, to me uh, as I was working with them and noticed, but it's a uh, again and uh, was understandably a very preference position to be working in the collection itself in the library and to have access not only to the fragments but also to the host volumes and be able to work around your way how exactly a fragment was used so in this case uh, in situ one could identify like small uh, holes which showed that the fragment was actually turned uh, 90 degrees and it was bound here. So one part of the leaf was uh, stitched, uh, so was glued to the board and while the other part of the one leaf was a uh, flying leaf. So uh, also one could not quite see on the digital facsimile is so that uh, there is kind of like a, um, a fat here. Um, all this, which one cannot nicely um, show in a digital facsimile, should, in my opinion, be actually transferred in uh, verbally in the description of the manuscript. So in the actual condition and look, and also in the history, when one say, well, it used to be a binding waste and it used to serve in this and this mode. And this one can deduce based on these and these features that one can see in situ. Uh, also very tricky, as it turned out, for documentation and digitalization are the sewing guards. So apart from all the paste downs, spine linings, and all the other features, it turned out to be uh, trickier and also very time consuming. It was mm -hmm. a special aspect of the Monze project. Uh, and uh, well, I'm not sure if I have to explain, sewing guards are positioned in the middle of choirs in paper manuscript. Uh, to support actually the binding so that actually the thread doesn't cut through the paper uh, um, paper leaves. And one see them in a uh, paper manuscript uh, found in the Austrian National Library and also in the incunables, which are uh, preserved in Linz. Uh, so previous librarian, again, going back to history, and they used to detach them. Uh, so by cutting actually around where the thread was uh, going from the binding and this uh, how like losing the fragment from the binding. And there were some, however, some disastrous cases where such fragments fell into pieces, uh, little pieces. 
It is, however, much easier to, of course, to describe and to put them together. Uh, and however, note in doing so, like uh, I was looking at them and arranging them in this order as you see on the image. However, then I had to close the folder and send it to the digitalization. And this is the moment when I had to think and actually to communicate uh, to his or her colleague who is doing the photos uh, how exactly to position the fragments or to be present during the digitization so that the pieces are ideally uh, digitized in the right order so that one doesn't have to spend a lot of time with uh, uh, Photoshop and cutting and pasting. And this is how our colleague was doing the photos using this uh, glass uh, prism, positioning it in the middle of the choirs and then uh, taking a photo. And this is uh, kind of like the information that gets lost at the middle. Uh, you see one A here in uh, in situ observation, which is missing, for example, here by the digital image. And this, however, allows people to make such nice uh, digital reconstructions. This one is uh, a work of uh, Veronica Drescher, evidently. So <laughs> thank you <laughs> again. Um, so it's not ideal. Uh, then again, there are some uh, letters missing in between, but it's, uh, I think, much better than destroying the fragments or messing up with the binding. I uh, think, however, to consider is uh, the amount of uh, time that one needs. It's uh, actually not only about uh, digitizing the images. It, one has to first document them, like look at the manuscript where exactly they are, uh, then uh, digitize them, then there is the post uh, processing of images, so manually renaming all the images so that it's understandable where exactly they are in the binding. Mm, then sometimes mirroring them, turning them around. And finally, cropping, merging, and trying to piece them together to reconstruct a folio. So in this example of uh, in Monze, there were 20 sewing guards, which amounted to 77 images, which are, and also must say, they are not like so easy to make images with the glass print, so it needs really time. And so to end up my presentation with a quotation from people who are much smarter than me, so manuscript catalogers are always faced with the need to make a series of choices, such as which features are to be described and which ones are not, how many, how minutely must each feature be described, which aspects therefore, should be addressed according to which formal rules do they have to be presented. And with fragmentarium, we are lucky that we already have kind of like formal rules and we know uh, how minutely a presentation description could be. However, one still had to make the choice how minutely one should make it, taking into account how much time one needs and uh, how much skills actually in uh, the description of a fragment comes coming from paleography, uh, codicology, quite often book illumination, the music annotation, text certification like a genre or uh, text certification like an author and manuscript tradition. So doing all this would require quite a lot of time. And this uh, taking into account how many undescribed manuscript fragments uh, there are in Leipzig and in Austria, and I guess all over the world. I guess what one needs actually is uh, doing more or less kind of a basic inventory, like a digital version of the Lyser Zeta for fragments this time. So that one have the basic information and ideally a digital facsimile so that scholars next would know where to look to make all this uh, more detailed, paleographical, codicological, uh, art historical, musical, and so on uh, studies. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Ms. Dobcheva. That was quite fascinating. We now have some time for questions. We already have a question here from Christoph Fluller, and he would like to know more about the differences between Leipzig and Vienna. How are the fragment collections made? Are fragments treated differently in Vienna and Leipzig? And how old is the interest in fragments in both institutions? What's similar and what's different? Hmm, it's kind of a, quite a broad question, thank you. Uh, so what's similar and what's different? 
Well, it's similar that uh, all both collections have uh, boxes of fragments. And in a way how they are stored today, it's uh, similar. So they all put in folders. Uh, so in this respect, I cannot say that there's uh, nowadays much difference. Uh, again, it's kind of like a curious difference that uh, in Leipzig, there are so little shoeing guards. So I'm not sure, uh, perhaps my colleagues from Leipzig uh, could, can explain if uh, there was no practice of detaching them or when they detached them, they didn't kept them or what exactly happened. So in um, Austrian National Library, there are quite a lot of them. And some, uh, sometimes they are like nicely treated uh, as uh, we saw also like put together sometimes, uh, you know, uh, build their like quite a mess to make because they fall apart. Uh, so that's one difference. Uh, as for the interest in the collection of fragments, so uh, well for Leipzig it's kind of like much uh, better documented because of uh, all this publication of Leiser and uh, the second yeah. volumes that they made and they can be connected with one name, one librarian. And in the Austrian National Library, we have the volumes and one can roughly say that they date from the same period, but um, yeah, one could say perhaps uh, which librarians were active at the time, but um, yes, not much more, I guess. We have several thank yous and congratulations to have to flooded the chat and I'll invite you to read those. We also have Eric White, who asks about the illuminated leaf that was rearranged for the uh, presentation of the host volume. And he wants to know that if the Traeger bond of that leaf is known, do we have that? Do, do we know where that came from or what that thing was covering? Um, hmm. So let's, so let's go back up to. So it's this one? Yes. I think so. Uh, so I don't think that it was known exactly. Uh, we must see in fragmentarium where I have I should have put it if it is known, but I guess it's uh, not known. It was uh, with a cartonage at the at the back. I remember that, but other than that, it was uh, well. I don't think sadly if it's known. Okay. <laughs> Peter Tall. <Yes. laughs> Right. Uh, thanks very much, Ivana. Amongst the Monse fragments in Vienna, have you crop come across any fragments in the vernacular, German, or even daringly Hungarian, which is very rare? Uh, so Hungarian, I don't think so. Uh, there, are, there were a number of uh, German fragments, which is explicable since in it's an Austrian monastery. Uh, most of them were, however, uh, charters, uh, letters, and uh, little textual like works, as far as I remember. There was one Dutch, however. OK. Bart Yaski writes, that was great. Are you also looking at the rep collection in Leipzig? And he has a link to the uh, rep signatures. The REP signatures? Uh, no. My two projects were one was on the detached fragments, and uh, the other one was uh, at this uh, fragmentary volumes only. And is there somebody else who is interested in doing them? Do you know? Uh, no. Perhaps a Christoph Market, if he's still on, could answer that. Because I think I would seem that, that a lot of students would, would be willing to work with any fragments, I'd say. Well, I think that quite a lot of them are actually digitized uh, when you look at the UBL website. Yeah. So, uh, my experience is that uh, the colleagues in Leipzig are quite open for uh, any kind of collaboration, so. Thank you. There are, there are, um very uh, few um, detached uh, fragments from the uh, Leipzig um, Municipal um, Library um, kept by the University um, Library. And uh, so 
most of the uh, fragments are still in the in the host um, volumes. Yeah. We are uh, digitizing uh, the the whole manuscript um, collection at the time since 2016, and uh, we are planning also um, to um, catalog um, scholarly the um, collection of the Leipzig. Um, municipal library. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Wow. And the the chat is very fruitful with lots of discussion going back and forth. I'll just read the, some of the comments. Uh, Eric White uh, notes that Leiser is noted for saving some early Mainz printed fragments in Leipzig and recording the host binding circa 1835. A good start. Uh, <laughs> Let's see what else is going on here. Um, Sagani Souza is addressing Peter Toth about the manuscript uh, 3571 in the uh, Austrian National Library that is from Hungary with the vernacular text of the Ten Commandments. So that's, uh, and the binding is also Hungarian with uh, Estergon notation. With regard to Mat Matthias Tischler says, has a question about Leipzig. Did you identify new fragments that can relate to Naumburg and Halle Saale? Mm, so Naumburg, uh, there were, uh, so this ch charter was from there and uh, others I don't remember now. But again, so all the fragments that we did are in Fragmentarium where one could uh, search and simply for also for the town. But I don't remember that any anything with Hans Allen. Okay, um, Christoph Mackert makes a, makes an observation about the, my experience that using illuminated fragments in order to have nice books is a phenomenon mainly in the 16th 17th centuries, and I think Eric White agrees with that, saying mainly 17th century. Thomas Falman, yeah, asks. How many new fragments from the ninth century compared to Bischoff's uh, repertory did you find in the Monse bindings? Well, actually, there, one could add quite a lot. Uh, perhaps uh, not uh, to originally new manuscript, but to manuscript where there were already some fragments from the Bischoff uh, described. One can then add further fragments. So uh, I'm not sh quite sure, like. 15 or 20 new one could uh, be added fragments to originally manuscripts. So from the cool engine time. Great. Matthew Holford asks, it seems like the record keeping at both Leipzig and Vienna was excellent, but are there any cases where the original housing of fragments was not recorded? Uh, I mean, original housing class. Yeah, like house volumes are. Uh, not that I know of, but I wasn't so working so long in the both libraries to know this deep and probably nicely kept secrets. Of <laughs> so. Uh, much, uh, too much uh, fragments um, of um, of which the host volumes was not rec were not recorded. Yes, that's too much. Yeah, quite. Yeah, it's quite, quite, quite a few in this collection, if I recall. Mm. That you just don't know where it comes from, right? It's just this loose thing. Yes, in this respect, uh, Lizer was a very nice exception in this nineteenth-century practice of not documenting where it came from, the fragment that he detached. So. He did his best. Oh, here's here's a here's a here's another great question from Peter Toft. Um, if I may ask one more, have you seen a case where leaves from a manuscript were reused in the binding of the very same manuscript? Um, so there are some cancelled leaves. One see this. Uh, this is interesting case in Leipzig where one see on both base downs there are cancelled leaves uh, which match very nicely the leaves within the um, the book. And it's also curious that one so the front base down 
was detached and was uh, in the fragment uh, collection. The back base down was left inside. Now, after we made this observation that it belonged actually again to the host volume, I think that uh, the restorators put this uh, fragment uh, back in the host volume because they share one and the same history. So it was now not, not, not any longer a fragment, so to say. Okay. Ed van, Ed, van, sorry. Ed van der Blist makes a comment that the Dutch fragment Leipzig UB1616 was already known to Levens in 1963. There's a copy of it in Leiden, University Library, BPL 2485. Uh, Christoph Fluler has a question on genre. How many what percentage of fragments are from liturgical ma uh, manuscripts in both institutions? Mm. Well, for Leipzig, that's kind of like hard to tell uh, because, uh, well, I did, uh, I said, 260 or so from a detached fragment in during the first project. And uh, these I picked up like from boxes. However, the boxes are already from previous users and readers arranged sometimes in thematical, sometimes in uh, periodical order. So one cannot say that uh, in this 260 or 70, if 80% uh, are liturgical, that would uh, correspond to all the other boxes. It could be that one box is spent only with medical fragments. For Monze, it's... Uh, oh, probably around 90% are liturgic, uh, so liturgical fragments. It's, they didn't have so much uh, of our classical text or so. And from the second uh, project in Leipzig, again, it's like the already the selection of the librarian who arranged them uh, and took, uh, so selected already the pieces. So it's again, not representative of all the binding ways that one could find in Leipzig, I think. But again, uh, it's clear that the liturgical fragments are the majority. Like, I guess with over 70%, one can be certain that it's on a good side of the truth. Wow. Well. <laughs> Thomas Falmania asks, have you found in the documentation from Vienna or Leipzig many fragments painted in purple to imitate ancient manuscripts? Uh, no. No purple. All right, well, um, we're that's the end of our list of questions and we're approaching the end of the hour. So I wanted to, you know, thank you again for a wonderful presentation and thanks to our audience members for your virtual attendance and for your fine questions uh, our, and useful observations. Our next Fragmentarium video conference will be on March 26, when Professor Dr. Adrian Papahaji of the renowned Babesh Bolyai University in Cluj will de deliver a paper, Evidence Preserved by Destruction, Recycling Medieval Manuscript Fragments in Transylvania during the parenthetically counter-reformation. We hope to see you there. And uh, goodbye, that ends the formal part of this conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>